This programme is of particular interest to us because it gives us the opportunity to partner with a team of academics to investigate a question that means something to us um, and a topic that relates to cultural value that is of particular interest to Manchester Camerata, but also to the wider sector. And I think there's so many questions that those working in the arts and cultural sector want to answer, but we don't have the time, the expertise, the space, particularly in the current climate, uh, to investigate those questions. So this felt exactly what we needed I feel that great things come when people work together. And I think this opportunity to work as part of the Centre for Cultural Value on this project gives us an opportunity to work with people we might not have worked with before. I think the opportunity to reach out, to work with a much wider pool of other experts, with people involved in the Centre for Cultural Value, with uh, industry partners, trying new things with new people and new perspectives, leads to things you might not have thought you could achieve. My top tip is to be honest, I think. To be honest about what it is that you want to get from the process. Be honest about what it is that you want to learn and be honest about your own knowledge and your own limitations as well. Um, if there's something that you don't know, don't be afraid to say it. The Centre for Cultural Value team will be on hand, as I said, to help you, um, to put you in touch with somebody who can maybe answer your question and the academic partner um, that you're paired with will be there to help with everything academic. So I would just say, don't be afraid, be honest and ask questions. Thanks, Mikey. So I hope that gives you an insight into um how exciting uh, it, it potentially is to bring someone from the cultural sector and an academic superhero um, and to see what can happen when they work on an academic research question together. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up my um, PowerPoint yeah, and start taking you through uh, for the day. And again, please don't forget to put your questions in the box whilst I'm talking Ben you are Tapmeister and vice versa when you're talking okay so uh, what what to expect today so basically we want we want you to be much clearer about the context and the purpose of collaborate uh, and to discover whether this is actually the right fund for you um, we want you to gain an overview of the application form and the process uh, and our key aim is to help those of you who, do, who want to submit the best possible expression of interest. We've had a huge amount of interest in the fund. Over 180 cultural organisations submitted their EOIs, and we've whittled it down to a short list of the top 10, which we'll be sharing with you uh, in, in due course. And um, what we want is to find the right academics, academics like yourself, who are dying to work on these questions and work creatively and collaboratively with creative people on answering their questions around cultural value. Ben. Okay, so we thought we'd just give you a little bit of background context for those of you who don't know the Centre for Cultural Value. Um, so this, this is our mission, this is what we're all about. Um, we decided when we were funded from uh, October 2019, not to kind of define in any you know reductive way what cultural value is because we realized that would probably take us the whole five years of our initial funding um so instead we have a, a really kind of broad um uh, interpretation and application of cultural value which is really this idea of anything that makes uh, a real difference to people's lives and to society so as you'll see from the projects, we're, we're taking a really broad view of culture. It isn't just the arts or things necessarily that are funded from the Arts Council, but also looking at everyday creativity as well. So a pretty broad kind of conceptualization of, of culture and cultural value. Um, and importantly, and this is relevant particularly for this fund, um, our, our kind of end goal, our vision is to help shape a more equitable and regenerative cultural sector. And this is something that's really come out of our recent research into the impacts of COVID-19 on the cultural industries. 
Um, we're funded for five years by uh, the AHRC, Arts Council England and Paul Hamlin Foundation. We work, uh, as Lisa's kind of intimated, with over 30 uh, affiliate partners from the cultural sector, um, a, a range of membership organisations like the Museums Association, through to big national beasts like Tate and the BBC, through to much more local and, and small scale organisations that, that kind of really help us deliver different strands of our programme. Um, and most importantly, for those of you here today, over the next year or so, we'll really be developing and rolling out an academic engagement strategy that's going to be led by Stephanie, who you met at the beginning. Um, so look out for opportunities to get involved in our academic networks uh, and events to really think through some of the, the complex aspects of cultural value, as well as, of course, engage with this particular programme. So um, when, when people say, what do we do at the centre? I mean, one of our problems, again, was to kind of rein in what a centre for cultural value might do. But essentially, we do three things, um, and they are research, um, evaluation and policy. So the, the first of these really is to review existing, existing knowledge, existing research and literature related to uh, what we think are the core themes and the most timely aspects of cultural value. So our core themes um, at the moment have been identified as culture, health and well-being. So we've spent the last two years, as you can see here, producing uh, podcasts and digests that really synthesise the literature on, on arts and health, essentially. Um, then, of course, the pandemic came and hit us in, in March 2020. So we spent the last 15 months also looking at COVID-19 and the implications for the cultural sector, um, for audience behaviour, for example, for business models. Um, our next theme that we're about to embark on is cultural participation. So looking at digital engagement, everyday creativity. So that feeds on, hopefully, quite seamlessly from our COVID-19 research. And our final theme will be culture, place and identity. So looking at really how the cultural sector can help to, to build back better, if you like, to parrot Boris Johnson. Um, you know, how the role of arts and culture in, in creating a fairer and more dynamic um, society for us all. In terms of evaluation, um, we, as some of you will know, have been working with an expert working group over the past year as well to, to co-design and co-develop a set of principles for cultural evaluation. So those are now available on our website if you want to have a look at them. Uh, Mikey, maybe you can find a link somewhere and post that in the chat for people who haven't seen the principles. Um, and the idea really behind these ultimately is to promote the value of a purposeful and proportional approach to evaluation. So over the next year, we're going to be working very closely with funders, um, trying to influence how the, the sector might embed these evaluation principles and how to make evaluation a lot more fun, actually, a lot more practicable uh, and a lot more real so that the sector starts to really learn from each other's mistakes as well as successes. So there's a big role here for reflective practice and acknowledgement of uh, constructive and productive failure. Uh, and finally, policy then. So policy, pretty much everything we do now, we, we try and influence and engage with policymakers uh, with this view to trying to stimulate a more equitable and regenerative cultural sector. So currently, uh, we're having regular briefings with DCMS and the Arts Council, really sharing as they emerge, I guess, the findings of our COVID-19 research. Um, and likewise, you know, the findings that will come out of these Collaborate projects, we have now the mechanisms and infrastructure to be able to feed these directly back to local, regional and national policymakers all over the UK. So we're working with uh, the Four Nations culture teams. Okay, so uh, let me just get this uh, slide up. So what is Collaborate? Well, in a nutshell, it's um, our open call funding programme. And how it works is that we're going to be investing £200,000 over the next two years to support collaborative research projects between people like yourselves and the cultural sector, specifically looking at underexplored and sector-driven questions of cultural value. Um, we're hoping to support up to 15 projects 
The awards are between five and twenty thousand pounds, and this can be used to cover all or part costs of uh, the research program, which can last between six and twelve months. So, obviously, this this session today is about uh, finding uh, and infusing academics like yourself to want to take part in this program. Ben mentioned earlier um, about what is cultural value, and obviously we recognise that there are many different perspectives about what culture is and what cultural value is. However, we've decided to take a view, and we've decided that the centre is funded to explore a social model of cultural value. So the definition of cultural value for the purposes of collaborate is the differences that arts, culture, heritage and screen make to people's lives, their tangible social and artistic value and impact on audiences, participants and communities. We're also interested in exploring the question of on whose terms that value is experienced and acknowledged. For example, everybody values culture in the same way um, and not everyone gets to engage with what they value most. So this is part of the question. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, on whose terms is the value acknowledged, cultural sector, organisational practitioner, audiences, communities or other. The aims of the funding, um, as, as you can see here, are uh, evidence, innovation and application and amplification. And what I'll do is I'll just take you through each of these uh, very quickly. So with evidence, uh, we want uh, an understanding of why cultural activity matters and how we capture the effects that they have, rooted in the real world questions of cultural sector and communities and shared in a way that is relevant and freely accessible. Basically, we want the research to support the cultural sector to better understand the value of their work to audiences, participants and communities, and hopefully in a way that is practically um, practically applicable. In terms of innovation and application, for the cultural sector, we want them to develop research, understanding, skills and ideas around how it could be applied. For researchers, we want, the, we want to give them the opportunity to develop emerging research methodologies, not limited to the fields of arts and humanities, and or an opportunity for the application of proven methodologies in new and exciting contexts. For both, we want to create a space for academics and creative practitioners to share ideas, experiment, and open up new ways of thinking together. And finally, in terms of amplification, we want to inform funders and share best practice about our partnerships, and we hope that the programme will have a legacy of ongoing partnerships or programmes of activity that continue to deliver value beyond the life. Okay, so Ben's now going to talk about uh, eligibility. Ben? Thanks, Lisa. So, yeah, I mean, key, key questions, obviously, in terms of, of who can apply. So the, fir the first is obviously people who are based in the UK or Ireland. Um, at the moment, under the terms of our funding, we need to restrict it mainly to the UK. Uh, the reason that Ireland is here as well is that we're, we're starting to have conversations with our colleagues in Ireland about possibly setting up a, a kind of sister centre in, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, so that's the first thing is, is really about where, where you're based as a researcher. Um, the next one, Lisa. So the other is currently employed at a UK or Ireland based university or HEI. Um, so there was a question in the chat about independent researchers. That the reason, the reason we, we ideally need people to be salaried is because the fund cannot cover the, the time of the lead researcher. Again, um, under the terms of our funding, we need to give the funding to cultural organisations and they then engage the research team. So the funding generally, certainly in the case of the pilot, covers the time of research assistants. It might be, you know, PhD students or, or postdocs, mm -hmm. for example, or independent researchers working with a salaried researcher in an HEI. Um, you know, we, we don't want to, to kind of engage in any kind of precarious contracting, which is the reason we really do want to work with people who have 
uh, paid for research time within the UK and Irish uh, HEI or IRO system. Um, obviously, we're looking to work with people who have uh, an idea, they want to start a new research project. Um, I, I certainly know from my experiences uh, back when I was an ECR myself, thinking about you know, struggling to, to conceive of what project I wanted to do, but having lots of interests and, and certainly lots of methods and methodologies that I wanted to apply. So the idea really here is we're looking for people who are really keen to apply some of their, their research, their research interests and passions, their methods that they're developing, or even try out a new method, as Lisa said, something pioneering or innovative or, or a bit risky. Um, and they're looking for a project that's already kind of half conceived, let's say, by a cultural partner that we can then match them with. Um, I think really importantly, again, as Lisa's touched on, it's really important that, that anyone applying is open to exploring and co-creating uh, this project. So, you know, our cultural partners, as you'll see, have, have kind of, um, you know, germinated some ideas, some of them more concrete than others for research projects. But what they're looking for and what we're looking for is, you know, academic expertise, research expertise to really come and hone those ideas, to really, um, you know, refine the research questions, to make them achievable and meaningful and ensure that they do um, achieve the goals that Lisa pointed out about, you know, the, the, the core aims of this programme, to really evidence how a certain project has made a difference to people's lives. Um, so this openness is, is probably the key thing that we're looking for and, and the kind of spirit of partnership. Um, and in terms of what you might have as, um, as an academic partner, first of all, a PhD or similar research qualification or experience. Again, we want to be as fluid as we can be about this. So by, by similar experience, we mean um, someone who's led a significant research project, who's demonstrably made um, an original contribution to knowledge, who has demonstrated critical thinking and is actively researching in a particular area related to cultural value. So if you haven't got a PhD, um, that's fine. We will ask you on your EOI form just to really evidence the kind of, you know, equivalence in research experience. Um, and of course, if for people who do have a PhD, uh, it's this idea of just, again, demonstrating uh, an active and ongoing interest and expertise in an area broadly related to cultural value. I'm just, I'm just going to pause on this broadly because one of, one of our goals at the centre is to really rethink who um, identify as, as cultural value researchers. We really don't just want to work with, you know, people who have PhDs or indeed professors in cultural policy or arts management, we really do want to, to take a, you know, as broad a view as possible. Um, and it's great here today to see that we've got people from architecture, from media studies, for example, but it might, we might have, you know, people in civil engineering who want to look at, say, acoustics. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, as long as you can kind of tailor what you, where, where your, your perspective and, and your methods and methodologies and background and how they might fit to one or more of the projects, we'll be very happy with that. Okay, Ben, there's a few questions in the, in the chat box that I want to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, there's one for Victoria, and she says, I understand the centre's rationale for wanting, uh, for wanting with salaried academics. Unfortunately, there is already a lot of precarity within academia that limits who would be, oh, I've lost it because there's more coming in, hang on, where's she gone? There you are, sorry. Um, there we go, which limits who would be salaried, who would be a salaried worker and eligible to participate in this? Danielle follows up with this idea of um, um, there's no honor honorarium. Um, uh, Sophie follows up with the idea of uh, those who have got fractional contracted appointments as a researcher and associate lecturer for a couple of different universities. So they don't have probably the time or flexibility to do that. And then I think, uh, Victoria, if you look at her uh, final point, um, I have a PhD, but currently employed in a temporary contract. And I'm quite interested in this 
are worried about the precocity of academia and how that might preclude my eligibility and availability. So Ben, do you have any thoughts on that? Because there's obviously some strong feeling in the room. Yeah, and, and I totally understand those. I think, you know, we, we well, for a start, under the terms of our funding, um, can't give this money directly to universities. Uh, there was a feeling from, from our funders that, you know, it wouldn't be fair to, to dedicate this amount of public money to full economic costing of academic time. That would eat up all of the funds. So I, I really do sympathise with that. Um, I think, secondly, research teams are eligible to apply. So as long as the, the kind of lead academic or the nominated academic is salaried, that would be the same, of course, with, with UKRI funding, that you are employed for the duration of the project. And the reason for that is that we, you know, we don't want to expect uh, the, the lead academic to do this for, for free. You know, we want to, to want to work with people who have their time costed in. But of course, if you are part of a team, or anybody would be eligible to apply as long as as long as the nominated academic is salaried within um, an HEI. I, I do accept it's not ideal that this might come across as as you know precarious in another way. But we were very keen not to exploit academics who are already you know overworked and overworking. Um, if if I, mean, I acknowledge as well, people will have you know complex uh, individual situations. So please do email us. Um, Mikey will put the the email address of the centre in the chat, and we'll you know reflect on those and get back to you with any specific eligibility queries. Thanks, Ben. And there's one final question which I'll answer from Dr. S. Andrew, who says, "Are you interested in working with design academics?" And I'm going to throw the question back to you. Are you interested in working with us? Um, so if if there is in the shortlist something that you're really keen on, please do put an EOI in there. Uh, OK, let me just check the questions. OK, great. So why should you apply? So I guess this, you know, despite uh, the concerns about uh, lack of um, remuneration for the academic leads, there's still some very, very good reasons why um, it would be beneficial to apply to the project. Ben, do you want to give it a go? Sure. And uh, yeah, just an answer to that last question. Yes, um, teams can apply. Uh, again, we just need a kind of, you know, nominated academic who is that salaried post. But yeah, te teams with an RA is, is absolutely great. So why should you apply? Um, I guess uh, for all for all of the other reasons other than the, the, the time of the lead or nominated academic will be covered. The, the first, I guess, is, is to really co-develop a project um, to more deeply understand an area of interest to you related to cultural value. So a chance to, you know, work with some, some of the world's leading cultural organisations, certainly some of the most pioneering and forward-thinking cultural organisations. Um, and I think as well, you know, the opportunity to be part of a, of a cohort of other cultural institutions as well as other researchers. So whoever gets funded, whether it's five or eight projects in this round, um, we will kind of look at you very much as a cohort and take you on that journey led by Lisa as our partnership coordinator. Um, so yeah, being part of, of that cohort and having access to a whole range of brilliant cultural organisations is the first reason. Um, this access to, to peers, as I've mentioned, so the kind of peer support network you'll get from researchers working on the other projects. Um, the learning resources, I'll cover those in a minute, but some of you will have looked at our, our platform, our Culture Hive platform, um, with all sorts of you know, useful digests of uh, you know, guides on, on developing research questions with, uh, with partners, for example. Um, guides on working effectively between cultural organisations and HEIs. So all sorts of learning resources that we, that Lisa particularly will work with you as a cohort um, over the six or 12 months. As, you know, for some of you, it might be a great chance to, to develop skills in an existing area or a new area to try, as I said before, to try out a new method that you're really keen to apply. Um, new ways to communicate research, you know, certainly at the centre where one of our goals is to make existing research more accessible. So um, we, you know, we develop podcasts, hopefully some of you will have, will have listened to the podcasts um, and short films, for example, we'll certainly be creating short films based on all of the projects that we fund in this programme. 
So, so kind of new pathways to impact, if you like, and, and again, to kind of experiment a little bit with um, untraditional outputs. Obviously, you know, we can't, we can't have an academic session without mentioning REF, sadly, even though most of us have, have put it to bed, hopefully for seven years. Um, so, you know, this is a great opportunity to kind of start um, new projects that in, in five, six, seven years by the next REF exercise, will have hopefully really generated and developed into impactful projects which may or may not you know develop themselves into ref impact case studies but we're very keen that these projects do develop into you know kind of at the risk of sounding like a dating agency meaningful long-term relationships you know that you will work with a new hopefully cultural partner um, and continue to do that for many years certainly again you know i've worked with say organizations like Yorkshire Downs through the Nesta R&D fund about 10 years ago and I'm still working partly with, with people like Yorkshire Downs so it's been absolutely instrumental to me and, and many of the colleagues some of whom are here today um, so yeah to really kickstart um, some impact activity that, that will hopefully lead to to bigger and greater longer larger grant applications for example and finally, yeah, to take to take risks in a safe space um, to work as part of this cohort with, you know, mentoring opportunities, with guidance, with feedback um, as part of a collaborative team, but to do something that you might not otherwise have the time or opportunity to do, to, to innovate, to be pioneering, to do something a little bit different. And certainly that was one of the criteria that we were looking for when we shortlisted the uh, the project ideas from the cultural organisations. Just one more point, Ben. And of course, yes, to, meant to develop future publications. Again, we're, you know, we're, one of the nice things about this, I think, is that there isn't any kind of onus on you to develop a written output. But of course, that there are opportunities for those of you who need to or want to uh, publish on the back of these projects. Thanks, Ben. Um, Astrid's posted a question, again, on, on the theme of, um, of salaries. Uh, whilst I understand the need of working with salaried academics, having no money available for some teaching buyout, for instance, will really limit who are able to do this. and will almost certainly stop most ECRs being able to do this, as in reality, the amount of hours in contracts for research activities don't really materialise. Do you have any aims in supporting ECRs or are you mainly targeting people at higher levels who might have more flexibility in their workload? No, we're, we really are targeting ECRs here. And again, I, I do um, sympathise with, with, with that predicament. Um, hopefully, you know, a, a lot of ECRs will have some research time dedicated to uh, be able to, to, to spend on this project. Um, I do understand that, you know, it's difficult, it's increasingly difficult at the moment. Um, but yeah, we're really keen to work with ECRs. It's something, again, over the next year, we'll be rolling out a whole program of activity for specifically for ECRs, partly because we want to, you know, to develop the field of cultural value research and who's part of that. We want to diversify the field. Um, but yeah, I totally take that on board and we will, you know, we'll work as hard as we can to make this viable for, for ECRs because it is aimed particularly at ECRs. Thanks, Ben. All right, shall we reveal the shortlist? Let's go for it. So these, these are the 10 projects out of 180 applications that the panel shortlisted. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these. Um, Mikey will post that link in the chat so you can look at detailed kind of abstracts or, or summaries and synopses of all of these projects. Um, but hopefully you can see here... Um, you know, what, what we were aiming for, which is a, a really diverse range of projects from a diverse range of organisations. Personally, you know, it, it was great to see that it wasn't dominated by the kind of great and good and, and world leading cultural organisations. Most of these organisations are small to medium, which is great. Um, there's a really good range of regions represented across England. We were, we were really disappointed to not have more applications from Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland and something we'll really work on for, for round two. But I think within England, we've got a really nice range here. So I'll just 
pause for a, for a minute or two and just let people read through while I have a quick look at the chat as well. So Maya, uh, you can apply for more than one project, um, but you can only be, if, if successful, you can only work on one project, okay? And then Danielle again, Ben has made a point around considerations around gender and racial pay gaps um, and the challenges of people on temporary contracts. Maya, loving the fact that you spoke for Joyce. And as Ben said, can you uh, you can uh, click on the link and have a look at the full EOI in detail. Ben, do you want to answer Jose's uh, question? Sure. Yeah. And um, diff different researchers can apply. You know, we we've said it's open to research teams as well, and hopefully that will allow for a little bit of flexibility. Um, we're, we were, of course, really mindful of diversity and precarity, and that there isn't any simple way to get around this. One of the things we, we have tweaked um, based on feedback was this, you know, hard requirement for a PhD. We've softened that to equivalent experience because we were aware of the systemic racism, basically, you know, within academia and how appallingly undiverse, especially the field of, you know, cultural value, arts and humanities is. So, you know, we're really mindful of all of that and then trying to be as, as open and flexible as possible. Um, but this, you know, this is this is all really useful feedback and we will take it on board. OK, let's move on. Ben. So, yeah, how can we help you prepare? Um, I mentioned the Culture Hive uh, platform. Again, Mikey, maybe if you if you can just post a, a link to our resources platform. Um, there, are, there are loads of resources there, and, and some of them are particularly useful, I think, depending on the project you might choose uh, for this particular programme. So we have, you know, essential reads from um, senior academics, so Beatrice Garcia here looking at, say, cultural value and evaluation. Um, I've already mentioned um, our evaluation principles. So a lot of the projects have an element, of course, of evaluation in them. Uh, and we will be expecting uh, researchers and projects to, to try and embed these principles. You know, they're very new. We're still, again, refining them based on feedback. Um, but hopefully they'll, you know, provide a useful kind of framework, evaluative framework for researchers to think through when trying to, um, you know, research and evidence and demonstrate impact. Um, so yeah, I just, I just um, encourage you all to have a look, obviously, at the Collaborate page, the FAQs that are on there, anything we, we don't answer today or you forget to ask us today, you'll be able to look back on the Collaborate page and get those FAQs. Um, Mikey's posted that link to the 10 projects. So as I say, you've got you know, probably 500 words synopsis of each of those in detail. So you can really think through which one or two maybe uh, projects you're most interested in. And then do, yeah, do look at Collaborate. There's all sorts of things that are be generically useful or, you know, more kind of um, specifically focused on the topics of the different projects. Thanks, Ben. So uh, let's move over to the nuts and bolts then and how the process actually works. Uh, there are three broad stages and we've completed stage one where we've selected from um, 180 a short list of 10 exciting sector EOIs. We're now at stage two where successful proposals have now been advertised on the website and we're looking uh, for academics to apply to work with one or more of the advertised projects. The deadline for submission of academic EOIs is the 26th of January. There'll be an assessment panel uh, which will review the academic expressions of interest and draw up a short list of up to three academics who would be potentially a strong match for each project. In the final stage, we'll introduce each of the 10 sector applicants with their, uh, with their recommended academic partners. Remember, up to three potential academic partners. 
they will then select the one that they want to work with from the recommended three. And we will be encouraging them to actually get in touch in person with each of the academics um, in order to ask questions and, and get a sense of, of how they might work with them. Once they've selected the academic um, uh, they would like to work with or group of academics, um, you will then work with them to co-develop a detailed research question, methodology and joint application, which will be costed. We don't, have, we, we don't need any costings until you put in your joint application. The dates for application development are from the 14th of March to the 4th of May. There's plenty of time in there because we're aware that there is the uh, Easter holidays in that time. From the 10 um, submitted grant applications, um, the assessment panel will award at least five to go forwards. And that's when the research journey will begin. OK, so um, I'm just checking. We, we haven't had any questions about the process. So I think what we'll do then is move on to um, the actual making an expression of interest. And what we're going to do is we're going to take you through each of the elements on the form. And um, again, I invite you to put your questions in the chat box um, so that we can answer as many as we can as we go through. Um, I've just seen there's a question from Alexandra. What would be the opportunities for meeting the partners before actually submitting an EOI? It's vital to actually have a relationship from the outset. Ben. Or do you want me to answer it? Shall I answer it? Go on then. I was going to, yeah. You so, go for it first. So imagine a scenario of someone putting in, uh, uh, of say 30 academics putting in an EOI to one cultural sector applicants. Um, what we've decided to do is we've very carefully structured the, e, uh, the EOI form and we're um, giving you in the next few minutes very detailed information on how to make a good EOI um, because um, we want to develop the relationship post submission. Um, we can't expect a cultural partner to try and develop a relationship with every single academic partner that is interested in working with them. So I hope that answers your question, Alexandra. Um, can you repeat the timeline? Um, uh, be interested in when it would start. Uh, so just to go back, um, the days for application are the four, uh, 14th of March to the 4th of May. Successful applications will be awarded in May. And we fully anticipate the research journey to begin in July of next year. OK, um, what have we got here? Uh, Maya, if a cultural partner doesn't have an expression of interest, what happens to them? Would this be flagged up as a missed opportunity? We haven't really thought of that scenario. And do you have any thoughts on this? Well, yeah, I mean, sadly, you know, we've got a short list of 10 and it, if no one expresses an interest, that one would drop out. You know, it'd be one of the ways in which we'd have to decide which five, six, seven projects to take forward. Um, it, it's worth saying, I don't know if you've said this already, Lisa, but this there will be around two this time next year for other, you know, for another um, cohort of projects. But yeah, it's, you know, it, it isn't necessarily the, the strongest on paper projects that will go through. It's also the, the match that we're really looking for here. Um, and there's based on that, there's a question, Lisa, from Victoria about, you know, collaborations are not just about shared interests and expertise, there's also personal interactions and encounters, which I know you're really mindful of, but there's a, there's a pragmatic realism, isn't there as well? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's not ideal, I know. I, 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 really, I really don't want um, the cultural sector partners to be in a position where they, they have to speak to lots of academics who are interested in their work. Um, uh, that's not about relationship building. It's not the time to build a relationship. The time to build a relationship is, is when they've got uh, the three potential matches. So, um, yeah, I, I'm afraid that's the way that it I, is. I mean, I just add, obviously, you know, I, if it were me, it's really important to do that desk research, to look at, the, at how organisations describe their mission and their vision. Um, to ask around, you know, colleagues who may have worked with them, um, go and see their work if you have opportunity. I mean, I, you know, it's kind of secondary research, isn't it? But I think 
again, ba based on our COVID research, organisations like academics are, are on their knees at the moment and they're really, really struggling to kind of do their day job. So we just felt ethically it wasn't fair to ask them to, to you know, engage in any kind of additional work uh, as part of the preparation. Of course, once the EOIs are in, that relationship building will start in earnest. Okay, there's a question from Kate around how, how do we deal with researchers' personal circumstances such as parental leave or sick leave? Um, we you know we'll, we'll be as flexible as we possibly can. There isn't a kind of cut-off point really for these. We are we are hoping that the projects will be finished in 12 months. So there is absolutely flex built into those projects and it's something we will deal with on, you know, an, on a case by case basis. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the, I would just say build in slack to the timeline to account for any, any kind of mitigating or unforeseen circumstances. I mean, um, one of the, one of the uh, values that we've got, Katie, is to try and be as people centred as possible when it comes to this. Um, so obviously, you know, we, we will build in flexibility circumstances around a really good question about ethical submission which has been puzzling me as well i mean no, in normal times this would be less of an issue wouldn't it but certainly at, at leads things are taking longer than they did before so yeah i would advise people to put in ethical approval applications um before the final submission just to not lose that time i suppose you know as ever, the first few months of um, a project would be around framing the research and honing those research questions and that relationship building while waiting for your ethical clearance. But, you know, it, it is at the moment ASAP, isn't it, getting it in to avoid any kind of um, particular delay. And so is it OK to apply to work with someone you've worked with before, Lisa? Totally. Absolutely fine. No worries. But we can't, oh, as, do you mean as a team of researchers or as a cultural organisation? Because as a cultural organisation, we can't guarantee, A, that obviously that the cultural partners project will have been shortlisted, so you know who's been shortlisted, and B, obviously, that the um, a, a according academic will be kind of shortlisted. But yes, the, the, I'm sure there will be some situations where both parties are shortlisted and you may end up working with somebody you worked with before. But even then, you know, we wanted to give organisations and researchers the opportunity to meet new, new partners, just partly to, you know, for, for networking purposes and for future projects. And then we have a question from Anita, what kinds of activities can be funded? I understand that teaching buyouts cannot. So, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly from the pilot experience, travel, um, equipment hire. So that the Manchester Camerata are using um, some biometric equipment, for example. So they've hired that in um, time for, you know, for freelancers working, say, with the cultural organisations. Um, what it can't be spent on as well is to develop a new piece of art. You know, we're not the Arts Council. We want to fund research. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it essentially is going to be kind of research assistant time, uh, travel, equipment hire, might be venue hire, room hire, etc. Uh, and also, lovely, you know, uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, sort of travel expenses or um, honorariums uh, for people who are taking part in the research are actual audiences and communities, especially those, you know, who suffer disadvantage in any way. So anything that enables them to take part in the research. Uh, is 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 allowed. So um, I was going to say something else as well. What kind of activities can be funded? Oh, it's left my mind. While you're thinking, okay. I'll answer these two. So cross institutional applications. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we would obviously really, really warmly recognise that. One of the joys of this um, is that the you know we have to give the funding or the the funds to the cultural organisation. So there's a lot more flexibility. Um, again, as most of you will know, university to university partnerships and, and contracting is taking an inordinate amount of time at the moment. So, so yeah, there's no reason why, you know, the, the kind of nominated academic couldn't be from Sheffield and work with a research assistant at Bristol. Or I suppose even having two um, nominated academics, haven't thought about that, we'll have a think about that. And then, yes, we are absolutely... Um, uh, 
compensating time for for freelance we i mean our, our center policy is we always pay for freelance time um however the whole project fund will not be spent on the freelance time it has to be proportional to the project but but yes and I remember the point I was going to make, Anita, which is that in our pilot programme, uh, a good proportion of the pilot funding is going to pay for the time of research assistance. Um, so, you know, so, so that's, that's just to let me know. OK, uh, those are all the questions. Um, OK, so let's move on then to making an expression of interest and keep those questions coming through. Thank you so much. Uh, for your interest um, and and your uh, yeah, your sharp eye, I think that's really cool. So Ben, over to you. So what will you bring to the party? Parties being the the mot du jour, aren't they? Really, or certainly word of the week. <laughs> um, we, you know, we're looking for for this idea of of match, really. And, and by match, you know, as I said before, we don't mean a neat, obvious fit necessarily. I mean, it might be. You know, you might have been always wanting to or have worked on very similar projects in the past, and that's fine. But you might be coming to this from a very different perspective. So we're really looking for, you know, uh, a really clear articulation of how your research matches or responds to and particularly will add value to the project uh, as outlined by the partner. Um, you, you will see when you look at the full kind of synopses of the project that we ask partners to, to kind of outline what they were looking for in an academic partner. Um, and, and to be honest, those were really varied. We didn't, we didn't select at all based on that criteria. And we just we were kind of intrigued and thought it would be useful in terms of relationship building and matching. Um, but, you know, one or two of them haven't ever worked with academic partners before, I don't think. So they weren't really sure what they were looking for. And, and, and really, therefore, it's up to, to you as applicants, as you know, researcher applicants, to, to kind of make that case. What is the link between your research and the core ideas and research questions embedded within those proposals? Um, and then more broadly, this question of how your research will add value to the cultural sector. Um, Again, you know, as I said at the beginning, one of, one of the premises really for the Centre for Cultural Value is that the cultural sector isn't great at sharing its experiences, good or bad. Uh, we, we do constantly kind of seem to reinvent the wheel. We, we don't share failure very openly as a sector. There's a lot of kind of defensiveness. So we're really looking to, you know, to have an open and transparent knowledge management system, if you like. So we really will share, as I said, through, say, a short film or a podcast or blogs or all sorts of creative range of outputs so that, you know, so that the findings of these of these seed projects are really transferable as widely as possible across the cultural sector. Um, and then the other thing we're looking for is obviously, you know, the benefits for you. So kind of how it, it will develop you as a, as a researcher, wherever you are in that research journey. And as I say, we are particularly interested in supporting ECRs with all the caveats that you've all quite rightly noted. Um, how, how we can develop impact, how it will develop your research profile, um, maybe take you in a different direction or cement the, the path that you're already on. Um, I think, you know, as usual, it, it'll be useful when we're assessing uh, your applications, if you can highlight uh, the gap, you know, why does the need to be research in this area at this time? You know, uh, obviously thinking of, say, COVID, what, what, why is it timely? What, what, will, what particular value will the research add and what particular unique value will your experience and expertise bring to play? Um, so does it address, uh, you know, a significant timely gap in knowledge? Um, again, if you look at some of our digests that we've produced, we always highlight huge gaps. So, you know, there are, there are enormous gaps in, say, arts and health research. We don't know very much about cultural practitioners uh, and the challenges they face when engaging in arts and health projects, for example. So you might want to look at some of those if it's relevant to your project and say how you'll address those. And then, yeah, is it emergent? We're, I think, you know, we were really looking for things that were, that were a bit different, you know, hence the Camerata project. It was, 
it was risky it was taking you know the researchers in a new direction in terms of applying their research in a different way and it was taking camarata in a different uh, direction in terms of working um with biometric technologies and, and understanding the audience experience in a pretty emerging and, and pioneering way so something that's a bit innovative a bit fresh a bit different that we you know that isn't really well acknowledged within cultural value or cultural policy or arts management research um would be really really valuable okay, thank you ben um, astrid's put a great question which i'm going to read because i love it the researcher is also part of an arts organisation who brings something meaningful to the collaboration. Would that be something that would be accepted, or should that be part of the? Or should that part of the researcher's work be kept separate? Thanks for uh, for answering, Stephanie. A resounding yes. Bring your whole person to it. Um, but remember what Stephanie says. Uh, you know, it needs to be something that would enhance rather than bias the research. Maya, you've asked about the Camerata project. We don't have time to go into details about that, but if you go to the website, uh, there is detailed information about what the Camerata project is about. So thank you for that. Okay, let's move on, Ben. So yeah, basically we're, we're kind of walking you through the, the EOI form. Uh, and again, you know, mindful of, of all of your time. Um, they, they are quite light touch, hopefully, won't, to, won't be too onerous to fill in. It's not, it's not um, you know, a jazz form and a, and a six page cage for support, so don't worry. But the, these basically are the questions on the form. So the second one is, you know, what are you looking for in a cultural sector partner? Um, we're aware some of you won't have worked maybe with cultural sector partners before, and some of you will have extensive experience of doing that. Both of those are fine. Um, what we're really interested in, again, is match. Um, so, you know, ethos, where, where's that shared vision? Uh, you know, lots of the projects, I guess, obviously given, given our mission and given where a lot of people's, you know, heads are at the moment, a lot of them are looking at um, questions of diversity and representation and creating a, a more equitable cultural sector. So you might want to focus on that in terms of ethos. It may be practice and methods. It may be the art form that you're particularly interested in. And that's, that's the fit between you and the organisation. It may be mindset. So organisations that, you know, Artichoke, for example, is one of them that absolutely take a risk and, and, try and do things that most people would think were completely crazy and, and unachievable and push all sorts of boundaries. You know, Helen Mary just talked brilliantly about that. So, you know, what kind of organization is it? Is it very, is it kind of hyper-locally focused? Is it much more national, like the Liverpool Biennial, trying to rethink its business model and its um, kind of audience engagement or target audiences? What does it mean to be a biennial? post covid with fewer international tourists for example so what are those shared values it may be around location um bizarrely you know three of the projects are from liverpool so uh, i know we've got a few people here from the university of liverpool or the universities in liverpool um it may be that you absolutely want to do that footwork you know um with those local audiences so one of the projects in liverpool is looking at class in particular working class audiences um, it may be the size or type of organisation that really appeals to you. Just really explain the interest and fit, basically. And then, yeah, in terms of helping us understand your approach to, to partnership working and working collaboratively, um, it'd be useful to hear about, you know, your processes as a researcher. How do you go about doing research? Um, for example, talking about co-research and co-design and, you know, authentically um, explaining and outlining how you have collaborated in the past with any kind of external partner or participant. What roles do you play so that, you know, the last question there, we don't expect this kind of binary between research happening here. I mean, on the contrary, uh, of course, cultural organisations engage in research and of course, um, academic researchers, like most of us in this area, have worked in the cultural sector. So. It's that meeting in the middle, isn't it? I think that's particularly interesting. Um, and, and similarly, responsibilities, how, how those are shared, how, how both parties develop through the relationship is what we're interested in. And then, you know, the next question, what experience do you have of collaborative research? Again, you know, I won't go through all of this, but 
Um, it, it isn't necessarily about working with cultural partners. It's just being able to explain that you are collaborative in, or you want to be collaborative in your research. You want to apply it outside of the academy. Um, and some reflection, you know, if you have done a lot of this, how does it, did it work in practice? What did you learn? How did you develop? And I guess most importantly, how has that informed your, your practice as a researcher? And then the, finally, I think this question around longer term partnership, as I said before, we're, you know, we're, we're aware that these funds are modest and they don't cover all of the things we would really like them to cover. So, you know, we did call this a seed fund originally um, or a piece of action research. I mean, it, it, it is a seed fund in that the, the funds available are relatively modest. I suppose £20,000 is less modest, but we, we are hoping and expecting these projects to lead to, you know, longer, larger grants and to certainly have a future life or legacy, both for uh, researchers or research teams and for the cultural organisations. So, yeah, we really want to hear um, about ambition and vision, long term ambition. Uh, the more ambitious, the better, as long as it's realistic within the budget and the time scale. The sustainability of um, the project, you know, what we asked the cultural partners, as you'll see, to really uh, try and outline this as well. But what are the opportunities for future life for these projects? How might they? What kind of funders? might be interested in taking them forwards. How, how could they offer a springboard for future research between you and that cultural partner or you and another cultural partner? Um, and then this question of influence, you know, how, how can the impact generated from projects influence, you know, reach out and, and kind of reverberate across not just the cultural sector, but also, um, uh, you know, academic life, journals, etc. How can how can you disseminate that research to give it that academic uh, as well as sector legacy? And originality, of course. You know, the more the more original this is, and the more it fits and addresses the gap, the more chance it will have of future funding. Thank you, Ben. Okay, over to me. And uh, what will make your application stand out? So I guess I'm in, I'm, I'm in a, a, a strange position because I'm not an academic and I don't get to read academic applications. Um, so the things that I look for are probably quite different, but um, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you what will really make you shy because I anticipate we'll be reading quite a lot of applications. Obviously there is a, a fit with the project. So your EOI needs to be directly relevant to the sector topic be able to answer their questions around cultural value um, uh, and in a way that supports what they're looking for in an academic partner. However, you're also allowed to do something completely different and make a compelling argument for a different approach to that which the, EOI, the sector EOI is asking for. We're really happy to be thrown curved balls. We welcome lateral thinkers. And we want to work with people who are keen to explore new ground. So, you know, be brave for those of you that think, oh, well, it's not exactly what they're looking for, but what I want to do is this. And I really think that this will help them answer their question in a way that they hadn't thought of. So please do bear that in mind. We're looking obviously for rigor of approach. Ethical considerations are important because some of the projects will be working with people who are vulnerable disadvantaged or marginalised in some way. And so careful consideration of those is important. But we're also looking for inventiveness, a risk-taking approach in the proposed methodology. So, you know, um, whilst playing it safe might feel safe, it might be safer to not play safe, if you see what I mean. Um, or you might want to take some mainstream methodologies and apply them in new and interesting ways. We're looking for an approach that will clearly answer the questions around cultural value, and it needs to be written in plain language and is jargon free. The reason being that um, for those that make it to the final shortlist of, th of up to three, um, the people who are reading your EOI may not understand what you're saying if you write in academic terms. 
And I'm not saying this in, in a patronising way. Uh, what I mean is you need to make it easily accessible because you don't know what their previous experience of academic research might be. And they'll be deciding who they want to work with on the basis of how you describe your approach and the value you think it will bring to them. Openness is essential. We really don't want to see academic uh, DOIs that have a fully pinned down research methodology at this stage. We're looking for evidence that you're comfortable with open-ended investigation, that you're open to collaborative co-creational -cre co practice, that you are willing to work flexibly. So using a Boris term, we don't want an often ready approach. We welcome new ideas and experiences. We're welcoming of new ways of thinking. Um, and we want you to be like that too, with all the opportunities and potential disruption or discomfort that might bring. It's also really important that you're there to learn from the process, not just the findings of the research. And I'm gonna say it again, it's really important that you're open to learn from the process not just the findings of the research. And in terms of commitment, obviously it's important that you, you, that you make space and time for this activity within your given capabilities, whether it takes six or up to 12 months. So, um, oh, sorry, Stephanie, I know two Boris terms. I'm not gonna say party. Oh, I said party. Um, so my advice to you is to visualize what this project might look like in practice for you and reflect on, uh, on your role and the expectations of the role of your sector partner. So you can really inhabit the project before you put your EOI in to, to create something that is proportional and something that you believe is workable for you. And finally, we're also looking for a genuine sense of excitement and motivation, reading between the lines of the application. So please do make your excitement palpable. Um, yeah, and that that's it. That's At all. Least, we, uh, oh, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Sophie just asked if we can just go back to number three, as in, uh, I think the third question. Yeah, next one. Yes, yeah. is that right, Sophie? I think that's what you mean. So yeah, really here, just outlining um, what what experience and or kind of approach do you take to collaborative research? So you know, if you have done this before with an external partner, what was the nature of that collaboration? How did it work? What did you learn through it? And how has it influenced your practice? Does yeah, that, does that what, answer your question? What if, what if they don't have experience of collaborative research, but they're really open to trying it? Yeah, absolutely. Outlining how you, you know, how you would go about it. Um, you, you know, you will have done some kind of collaboration. It may not have been a formal research collaboration, but presumably, you know, collaborated with research participants, for example. It, it's really here about ethos and approach that we're looking for and how that has or would develop your research thinking and research practice and methodology, for example. Okay. So oh, I don't know. Oh, I'm just going to stop there now. I'm just getting mad with my roller. There we go. So um, that's the end of the formal part of uh, explaining um, Collaborate and hopefully furnishing you with everything that you need in order to put in a, a really, really exciting EOI, should you so wish. Uh, we're going to stop the session in a moment. Uh, for those of you who want to leave, you can, you can now go. Um, and if anybody wants to have a little conversation with us afterwards, remembering that we can't go into the nitty gritties. Um, this is just a general helping you put together a, a, a good EOI proposal. Uh, ben and I will be hanging around um, for a short while. So for those of you who need to go, thank you very much for your time and attention. And for those of you who want to stay, just hold on for a moment. Yeah, thanks everyone. And, and as I said before, if you have any, you know, complicated or, or specific questions, please do email us at the CCB address and we will get back to you ASAP. But yeah, th if you are leaving, thanks very much for coming along. Please, please do spread the word, especially if there are projects there that you think colleagues, friends, partners, whatever might be interested in too. Um, you know, we, we want to hear from as, as broad and diverse a range of researchers as possible.